Welcome to another edition of the uh, fun, the Finite Element Seminar at Livermore, Finite <coughs> Um It's our pleasure today uh, to have uh, uh, Jeff Banks from RPI. Um, I didn't know that, but I, I was just looking at his bio. He actually did his uh, bachelor and master and PhD at RPI. So Indeed. now he's back there as a professor. Uh, but between that, he spent a lot of time at Livermore. He was a postdoc and, and then staff. Um, so it was up in 451 with uh, a lot of, well, actually not. You were not in 451. Yeah, I lived in, well, I, I was for a little bit, not too long. A little bit, okay. So anyway, we uh, quite a few of us know Jeff and uh, he's been working on um, kind of for the last, I don't know, five, six, 10 years maybe on these Galorkin differences methods that are very interesting, and he's going to talk about uh, well fluid structure interaction and compatibility coupling today. Jeff, let's yeah, so away. thank you very much for the invite, and uh, and thanks for putting together the series. I already see a typo on my slides, so that's that's excellent. So I'm going to talk about fluid structure interaction um, as a way to get into Galerian differences, but I'm not going to get to GD till mm, pretty pretty close to the end. But I know since this is a finite element group, I I need to talk about something. So this is in collaboration with a whole lot of uh, different people, a couple of whom are actually here nowadays. Uh, Longtime collaborators, Bill and Don, uh, Brett Buckner is now at MathWorks. A couple of folks in engineering, Jason uh, Guillan and, and Sharon G. Uh, Chi and Dan, of course, who are at Los Alamos, but are in this meeting, and, uh, and Tom Hackstrom, who's uh, I've been working on with GD since since we started up. And of course, always like to thank my, my sponsors, DOE, in various forms, let me get a laser pointer, NSF and uh, LNL and, and RPI. All right, so this talk focuses on our, uh, on fluid structure interaction, and I'm gonna talk about partition solvers for fluid structure interaction. All right, so what is a partition solver? Well, a partition solver is, a, so I have a simulation here, a picture of a simulation here where I have some high-speed compressible fluid, and then I have some elastic bodies, these little noodles, the idea of a partition solver, if you're not familiar, is the fluid is going to be some solver. The solid is going to be some solver. You can think of those as each some code, some package maybe. And then they're going to talk to each other only along the interface. All right. So this is in contrast to monolithic type schemes where you put everything into one giant linear or nonlinear system and then try to solve it. So why do I do this? Well, the component solvers can remain independent. So that means a couple of things. I can use existing solvers. So people have put in, you know, hundreds of thousands of hours on um, writing the code. Maybe they don't know how to invert some part of the system really efficiently. I don't want to have to redo that. Plus, if you start to couple things together, uh, you're going to have to solve a, a system of mixed type, which potentially could be really challenging to precondition, uh, which is ultimately going to lead to slow convergence of your H2 solvers. You can also take advantage of uh, time scale separation. So you could mix implicit and explicit integration like we do quite a bit. And in principle, you can already uh, see that you've broken the problem into some number of subproblems, and so in, in some sense, you've already um, sort of done some of parallelization. So you've you've helped yourself out a little bit as it relates to mapping to large machines. Okay, so the trouble with partition solvers is what's traditionally known as the added mass instability. This is a bit of a catch-all phrase, but what is the issue here? Well, the issue is if you take that picture that I just had up there, I've got a fluid solver and I've got a solid solver. I've got to have some way they talk to each other at the boundary. And the way they talk to each other traditionally is that the fluid supplies the force to the structure. So the structure moves in response to what the fluid has exerted as, as a force. And then the structure says, all right, to the fluid, the boundary has now moved in a particular way. And you're going to have to do some sort of iteration around this before you take one time step. All right, so the issue is, the traditional issue is that you may need a lot of unrelaxed steps uh, in order to get these solvers to be stable. Now, there's been some um, analysis in the literature, uh, and we're going to sort of build on some of the stuff that's already been done, but we take a slightly different approach from, from most other folks. So, first of all, wh where does this added mass instability come from? Well, if I have a body in a vacuum, and I apply a force to it, the thing just moves according to Newton's laws of motion, right? So you've got, you know, translational and rotational degrees of freedom, F is MA, and the thing moves, right? So it goes from one spot to the other. 
If I have that same body in a fluid, if I apply the force, the trouble is some amount, if it's going to move from one spot to another spot, it has to move a bunch of fluid out of the way. It's got to entrain some fluid behind it where there is no longer a body. So there is some amount of the fluid, which is also going to move as a response to this force, which is applied to the body alone. All right. So that is the added mass. It's the mass of the, of the fluid, which has been added as an effective mass to the body. So it doesn't actually do F as MA. Well, it does do F as MA, but it's in a sort of underhanded way because you have to move a bunch of extra stuff uh, at the same time. All right, so that's where, if you don't deal with that stuff properly, you get into trouble in a partition solver. And that's a generic statement that's probably uh, true. I'm, I'm happy to say that's probably true. So how do we deal with this? Well, the way we've dealt with this is to say, so this, I've got this picture here and there's some words, but the basic idea is the fluid thinks there's a velocity at the interface and the solid thinks there's a velocity at the interface. Well, the fluid also thinks there's a stress at the interface and the solid thinks there's a stress at the interface. It's not correct to say that the fluid applies the stress to the solid and the solid applies the velocity to the, to the, to the fluid, but the flip is not true either. And so we've come up with a way to think of putting these two predictions, what we call them predictions, into this interface projection. And we have a way of saying, well, what is the actual interface velocity and stress? And then those are applied as boundary conditions to the fluid and the solid, and then we advance. And that's the basic idea. And the mechanics of doing this, uh, the way we've done it, is through the so-called compatibility conditions, and I'll get into that in a minute. All right, so the schemes, when we do this, we've been calling these added mass partition schemes. Uh, I've started to call them compatibility coupling techniques, but AMP is something we've had for a long time, so I'm going to stick with that as well. Oh, all right, so here's an example. I've got a concrete example. I, this case you've already seen, high-speed fluid. Uh, this is a, a linear elastic body, but it could be a nonlinear elastic body. I've hit these two bodies with a shock, and they move according to whatever the governing equations are saying. Okay, so that's the case I want to I want to start with. Well. I like Green Guard's axiom. Leslie Green Guard said this to me one day, tongue in cheek. It never hurts to start by writing down the exact solution to the problem. Well, what does that mean? It means I have written down a problem that's simple enough that I could actually write down the exact solution. So, what is that problem in this case? It's this very simple problem, which I would call a, a fluid solid Riemann problem. I've got a linearized uh, solid equation on the left, linear elasticity. I've got a linearized set of fluid equations on the right. Well, here it's the Euler equation, so I guess it's nonlinear. And the coupling conditions are no jump in velocity or stress at the, at the interface. And then I'm going to linearize the thing, uh, and I'm going to solve it. Okay, so when I solve it, I get basically the solution to a Riemann problem. And if you've read through Toro's book, you're always going to call the solution at x is equal to zero this star state, rho star, v star, and p star. So the basic idea is to say the fluid thinks something, the solid thinks something, right? That's this rho naught, v naught, p naught, and this rho naught bar v naught, uh, sigma naught bar. Those are the predictions, and the Riemann problem tells you how the thing evolves, okay? So then you really, what you have at the interface is really these starred quantities, rho star, v star, and p star. All right, so we're going to do, we're going to apply those as boundary conditions in our AMP partition scheme. And we're going to call these compatibility interface conditions. All right, so they embed this solution as discrete interface conditions. So now you see here, the interface velocity in this case is no longer the velocity from the solid, which would have been this V bar, or the velocity from the fluid. It's an average, but there's also this jump in the stress term. And the stress is no longer the stress from the fluid, which would have been this sigma naught term. It's an average of the stress in the solid and the fluid. And then there's the density as well. And you'll notice in these equations that the traditional coupling is the large impedance limit. Z is the uh, impedance rho times C. So if you have the large Z limit, the Z bar is bigger than Z, then you get the velocity from the solid and the stress from the fluid. Okay. I, I should say also, if you have any questions, feel free to interrupt. Talking to a screen is tough sometimes. But so that if you do this, the stability of the partition schemes that you write down varies very significantly from what you would get in the traditional scheme. So I'm not going to go through the details, but if I use the first order upwind method, and then I use these interface conditions, it turns out that 
the scheme with this funny weighted average is stable under the usual CFL constraint, lambda is less than one, C delta T on delta X is less than one. Whereas if I use the standard approach where I take the velocity from one domain and the stress from the other, that thing is only stable for some restricted lambda. So lambda's got to be less than the minimum of one and this funny quantity four over one plus row, the, the ratio of the rows. So what this means is that if one of the bodies is sufficiently dense, I got to start taking a smaller and smaller CFL limit, which decreases to zero as the density ratio increases. Okay. All right. So just to show you that it works, that's a simple problem. You have to go through the details to, to do it in multiple dimensions, but we've done it. Here's an example where I have a, uh, a, a solid compression wave. So the outside is a solid impacting a compressible fluid in the middle. So that solid compression wave is going left to right. And you'll notice, for example, in this middle set of pictures here, that solid compression wave has turned into two reflected waves coming off. That's because there's a P wave and an S wave because it's a, an elastic solid and it's transmitted things into the fluid. And you notice that for light solids, the traditional coupling would fail, but this new scheme is, is nice and stable. Everything is fine. We can take a medium solid where the density of the solid is the same as the density of the gas. Again, the traditional coupling is going to fail, but this new AMP scheme works just fine. And then we've got a heavy solid case where uh, we've, we've taken row bar as 10. So 10 times the solid is 10 times heavier than the fluid. Then the traditional coupling scheme is fine, um, but so is our scheme. Okay, so that's, that's the basic idea. All right, so now you get into the question of what happens if I do more complicated things. So, for example, you might think this is simpler, but it's actually not. What if I replace those elastic bodies by rigid sticks? And right, so these are now rigid bodies rather than deforming bodies. Okay, so it looked nominally similar, uh, but now they're rigid. Okay, so I can still do a similar type of thing. The principle is exactly the same thing. It turns out that the principle is still these compatibility boundary conditions. But the basic idea is I'm going to ask what is the velocity on the body and the stress on the body for this solution to this so-called Riemann problem. So now what do I have? I have sort of a body. So in order to define the body, I've got a mass. Uh, it doesn't have a stress. There's no stress in this body. It's only got a velocity and acceleration. And then in the fluid, I've got a full set of states. I've got a density, a velocity, and a stress. Okay, so I've got Newton's laws of motion. So all I've got is a mass and uh, a position and a velocity. And I've got linearized Euler equations here. Turns out if you solve for VB and sigma B from the theory of characteristics, you get that the stress applied to the body is actually the stress in the fluid plus this Z times the jump in the velocity. And you remember the Z times the jump in the velocity term was essentially present in the compressible case. And we see it here again. Okay, so this is interesting because now I have exposed how the stress on the body depends on the velocity of the body. Okay, so if I stick that into Newton's equations, I no longer have F is MA exactly because F now depends on VB. So if I put that in, I now have an equation where even if the mass of the body is zero, so if this term goes away, this equation is still going to define the velocity of the body. Now you could think about this as essentially saying that the force has to be exactly a balance of the velocity here. So the force effectively has to be zero because the mass is zero, right? So that would say that if the applied force was not zero and the mass was zero, the acceleration would be infinite, right? So this is sort of exposing the constraint that the force has to be zero in the case of zero mass. Okay, so you can again do the same kind of analysis and you can show that if you use this first order upwind scheme and this, uh, this stress is really this stress in the fluid plus this jump in V, this scheme is gonna be stable if there is any mass of body that's bigger than or equal to zero. It doesn't even have to be uh, uh, strictly positive. It can actually be zero and the CFL number is gonna be less than one. Whereas if you take the standard technique where you just take the applied force, the applied stress as being from the fluid, that thing is only gonna be stable under restricted time step delta T. And you see that as MB goes to zero, so is the time step, okay?
Okay, so you can, again, put this into 2D, uh, 3D, uh, all you like. What happens is in 2D, what's gonna happen is that instead of having just a, a, a scalar times the velocity of the body, you're actually gonna get tensors, which couple all degrees of freedom that are the translational VB degrees of freedom and rotational degrees of freedom, which are omega. So these A, V, V, A, V, omega, those are added mass tensors, they're three tensors, uh, and they are defined through certain surface integrals around the body. Right? So this is starting to get reasonably complicated. So what has to happen here is you need to perform these integrations. You're gonna have to perform them at every single time step. Uh, and it turns out that this particular question was a question that Love originally formulated uh, um, and then Taylor followed on, so 1905 and 1942. And it was interesting to us that uh, we had sorted this out based on an algorithmic consideration rather than thinking about the actual mathematics of, of, the, of the solutions to these equations. Okay, fine. So you can do that. Here is uh, a case. This is a shock hitting a zero mass ellipse. So it's not like the mass in the code is 10 to the minus 10 or something. The mass in the code is zero. Uh, we don't divide by zero anywhere and we get perfectly defined and, uh, 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 set of equations. This works, this whole simulation's got AMR, it's got all the, the accoutrements going on. So everything is quite robust, it's working quite well. Okay. Okay, so now you can go on to more, more difficult cases yet. So if you bring in incompressible flow, and this is where I, I promise we're getting close to GD eventually, if you bring in incompressible flow, things get a lot more challenging, as you may know, because the incompressibility constraint is its global constraint. You could think about it as something with infinite propagation speed. Okay, so you got to deal with that. So here's just an example case where I have some, Dan, of course, knows this case well. This is the RPI solids, which have some pin in the I and the P and the R. Uh, and then we've got an incompressible flow, which is moving these bodies. Oh, I should say, we happen to, in all the stuff that I've talked about so far, we use this overlapping grid technology. It's really not required that you use overlapping grids. It just happens to be the technology that I've been using, uh, which gets to one of the points that I'd like to uh, make these types of techniques available to other simulation infrastructures, including FEM. And so I have to deal with how do I implement some of these schemes? And that's where I'm going. Is there a question? No, okay. I think you're good. All right, so it's kind of strange that you can use a 1D incompressible flow as a model problem to help you figure this out, but it turns out you can. So I'm going to use this 1D uh, model problem. You've seen it now a couple of times. I have a fluid on the left in blue and a solid on the right in red. This is linear elasticity, incompressible Navier-Stokes on the left. Well, incompressible Navier-Stokes in 1D is phenomenally boring. It's sitting right here. All right, so basically what this says, right, if, if, if you've got the two derivatives of P is zero, well, this term here is pretty boring, okay? But nevertheless, I'm gonna pretend I can't solve these equations. I'm gonna try to write an algorithm that will do this instead. And so I still have this nice characteristic structure with the solid, and again, I have the interface coupling conditions, no jump in V for the normal stress. Okay, so, I'm gonna integrate the fluid momentum equation. Right? So this is now just integrated from T minus delta to T. I can solve these equations of linear elasticity using characteristics. So the characteristics in the solid would give me this. And then I can combine these two equations. And those two equations now will give me this equation at the bottom. This is now a, a mixed integral type boundary condition for the, for, the, for the stress on the interface. So I've got P by itself and then the integral of sort of the derivative of P, okay? Equals stuff on the right-hand side. Stuff on the right-hand side you should think of as known stuff. So this is like a generalized Robin condition because I've got P and the derivative of P, but it's also got this time integral. And the time integral tells me the scaling for the weighting on this Robin condition effectively. Okay, so this is stable under the usual uh, time step constraint. So again, if I do the first order F1 scheme in the solid, trying to be as robust as possible, I use this AMP algorithm, which is expressed here. That thing turns out to be stable under the usual CFL constraint. So this is fairly 
fairly boring in the sense that the algorithm just works. The more interesting thing is what happens if I use the traditional scheme. The traditional scheme is unconditionally unstable. I should say the unitterated traditional scheme is unconditionally unstable. So does, in practice, it doesn't mean that your code would blow up. Probably you would just need to iterate potentially a lot in order to stabilize it. Again, so you use the first order up one scheme. You do this traditional approximation where the velocity is taken from the solid and the stress is taken from the fluid. That thing is only stable under this constraint. Okay, now this constraint is an interesting one. It's saying that it's only stable if the mass of the solid in a single cell adjacent to the boundary is less than the entire fluid domain. Okay, now that in some sense is not surprising because the entire fluid is able to move as a rigid body effectively because it's an incompressible flow. So there is a mode of motion for this fluid, which is the whole thing moving as effectively a brick. Right? So you're trying to balance the mass of that whole brick against the mass of this solid, only how far the wave could propagate in a time step. Okay, so that's really what's going on here. So in practice, what this means is that for coarse, meshes, for coarse meshes with large time steps, the thing may appear okay. But if you start to go to sufficiently fine grids, you're gonna, think, you're gonna observe that the scheme gets stiffer and stiffer and stiffer, and you're gonna have to iterate more and more and more to stabilize. And this is in fact what folks have noticed uh, over time is their solvers get harder and harder and harder as you refine the grid. Now it turns out that this uh, 2D analysis, uh, um, this analysis, this 1D analysis is actually a worst case of 2D or 3D. Again, it's that mode where the entire fluid is moving effectively as a brick, right? So it's sort of the, the worst mode in the system and all the higher frequency modes are gonna be a little bit easier in some sense. Also interesting that the anti-traditional scheme, which is something that nobody implements, that's to say you take the velocity from the fluid and the stress from the solid, that is formally stable, provided that you've taken a sufficiently fine grid, right? So it's the opposite case, where this scheme would appear bad to start, but it would actually become a good scheme as the mesh is refined, okay? Okay, now on to GD effectively. So this is what happens if you try to do this scheme in the case of Stokes fluid and uh, linear elastic solid. So I've got the equations of fluid, INS is sitting here. I've got the equations of the solid sitting here and I've got my interface conditions, no, no jump in velocity or normal stress. The amp condition that you get is here at the bottom. Now it's got similar form. It's got a P and a DPDN, okay? Again, the time scale Delta T is because of that time integral there, but you've got P, DPDN, this term on the right is fine, it's known. The problem term is gonna be this curl curl term, right? So this is a high derivative term. Curl curl's second derivative, of course, right? So this, you can think about that as essentially uh, um, Laplace. And so that's gonna be where things get strange because I need on the right-hand side of this mixed boundary condition, curl curl. Okay, so these are non-standard conditions that pop up as a result of having done this compatibility coupling. Okay, so anyway, this is the scheme. We can implement that. I can verify that the thing works. Here is an example of an exact traveling wave uh, solution for Stokes flow, linear elastic body on the top, uh, the fluid on the bottom. At the top is the density of the solid is 20 times less than the density of the fluid. And on the, dense, on the bottom is the density of the solid is 100 times the density of the fluid. And in both cases, the scheme is stable uh, and everything is fine. In fact, I can look at a convergence store, uh, uh, study for this case for a variety of these uh, deltas, the mass ratio. And you see I've got second order convergence in all these cases. And just to say that things agree with the theory, we did a study where we took a, a scheme which appeared to be stable for a mass ratio of eight, the solid is 800 times that of the fluid. And you see if I have a, a, a coarse grid, it looks stable, it looks stable, it looks stable, it looks stable. And then all of a sudden when you run it for a sufficiently fine grid, uh, the code blows up. Same thing for mass of, this, of, of, of the solid is 400 times the fluid or, you know, 100 times the fluid. So everything here is consistent. Now, again, the, so there's other cases we can do. Chi will recognize this. So we've done this for uh, rigid solids, 
I'll just play the video. It turns out this case is very challenging in many respects. Um, there's actually an added mass, but there's also an added damping term. Um, but you can put all these together. The, again, the problem here is when you follow the procedure that leads to these stable partition schemes, you wind up with very non-standard boundary conditions. So in the case that I showed you with Stokes flow, you're gonna get a curl curl on the right-hand side. In the case that's sitting right here, you're actually gonna end up with a, a mixed integral type condition. So there's gonna be a constraint equation that is effectively the integral of the, of the stress around the body it has to sit in there as a boundary condition. So they get really, really complicated. And that's where I'm gonna make the tie to GD here. So these are non-standard operators. They have high derivative terms. And in fact, a lot of times when I get into the details of the algorithms, there are even higher derivative terms, third, fourth, fifth, sixth derivative terms. That's going to be a potential challenge in the context of energy stable weak form methods. Think for your uh, uh, funded element types of methods. All right, so what kinds of methods am I talking about here? Well, you've got basically, well, you've got summation by parts. I'd like to think of summation by parts as a discrete weak form. You've got FEM, which is sort of a continuous weak form. Within those two, you've sort of got the idea of p-type refinement methods. So here on the top is a p-type refinement method. If I want a higher degree uh, polynomial, or if I want a higher order method, I, I enrich the space, I get a higher degree polynomial by adding interior degrees of freedom, right? So in this case, I'm gonna get one, two, three, four, five. So I'm gonna have a quartic polynomial. And then I'm gonna get these basis functions which are element-wise basis functions. They're continuous across the element, of course. Uh, on the other end of the spectrum is, of course, Tom Hughes' current uh, interest, which is the B-spine type finite element methods, where you don't add new degrees of freedom to the elements, you add extra continuity at these interior degrees of freedom. There's a couple of things that happen if you impose higher continuity at the inter-element boundaries. If you impose higher continuity, the basis functions either become global if you have nodal degrees of freedom or they become local and you have modal degrees of freedom. So if you keep modal degrees of freedom, so you have local basis, then if you wanna resolve say a nonlinearity, you need to actually do a global operation. So that's one thing that does happen. The other thing that happens is it still doesn't fix things at the boundary. As you see here, I've got two little dots right at the boundary. Those are gonna to lead to essentially the same issues that prop up when you add interior degrees of freedom in standard finite element methods, and we'll see how that, how that plays out. But these are essentially the, what I like to think of as the two basic ideas. You can add interior degrees of freedom or extra continuity. Now, it turns out that there, there is a relatively unstudied alternative. Corman studied it a little bit, um, but we've taken off with this, where the basic idea is instead of adding either interior degrees of freedom or adding extra continuity at the boundaries as a global constraint, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to do piecewise polynomial interpolation. So what that means is if I'm on some element, say this cyan element, and I want now instead of just having a linear polynomial, I want to have, you know, a third order polynomial, cubic polynomial, I need two more degrees of freedom. Well, I'm just going to, instead of adding new degrees of freedom, I'm going to look at the neighbor to the left and to the right. And then I'm gonna move over to the red one. So in the red one, instead of adding new degrees of freedom, I'm gonna to look to the left and the right, and I'm gonna include those. And now these red and the cyan and the blue and the purple are all just local pth order polynomial interpolants, in this case, third order polynomial interpolants. And then your, your global polynomial is gonna be a piecewise uh, version of that. So here it's a piecewise continuous cubic polynomial. This is actually just standard piecewise continuous polynomial interpolant, okay? Now you can figure out a basis having done that process, right? So it's a, it's a nice trick to be able to just say, look, I'm gonna look at the derivative of that reconstruction with respect to each degree of freedom. But at the end of the day, you can just realize there is a basis associated with that type of interpolant. So if I wanna know what is the basis function associated with the degree of freedom at X zero, well, X zero plays a role in four different polynomials. It plays a role in the cyan one, it plays a role in the red one, the blue one, and this purple one. And so then your basis function is going to be the amalgamation of those, which is this thing at the right. Now this basis function spans multiple, if you wanna call them elements, it spans multiple elements, and it is not smooth at the nodes, 
but it is interpolatory. So it's got a value of one at one point and it's zero at all the other nodes. And it's, again, it's global. It's, in this case, it's continuous. They don't have to be continuous. They don't, they can be smoother, but in this case, it's a, it's a continuous. Um, the derivative is not continuous basis function. I can then do this at any order I like. So here's a third order basis function, a fifth order basis function. P is seven, P is nine. And there's only one basis function for the entire uh, interpolant, right? This thing just slides along at each degree of freedom. It's the same basis function, but translated over and over and over. So there's one basis function at any given P. Okay, so that's fine. Now I can just run it through standard variational techniques. The solution is going to be written as a linear combination of those basis functions with the unknowns being the UJs. Okay, it's an interpolatory basis, so the solution is just the sum of UJ phi J. Forget boundaries for a moment. We'll get back to boundaries in a moment. I'm going to use the standard inner product notation. Suppose I want to find the second derivative. Right? So I want to find the second derivative. I hit it with um, a, a smooth uh, test function. I represent everybody in the space. Uh, and then I'm going to wind up with a system of linear equations where the coefficients are just these m's and these k's, okay? Now, again, those coefficients are the same at every degree of freedom. So the discretization looks exactly the same at every degree of freedom. So in that sense, it looks exactly like a spline type of method, or it looks exactly like a compact finite difference method. They just translate. Because it's translation invariant, on a periodic domain, everything's a circulant matrix effectively, so I can do uh, a DFT effectively. So I can look at how this scheme behaves for UJ being E to the IKX. I can compare that to what's supposed to be true for the second derivative minus K squared. And I pull out the symbol of that operator. In the finite difference land, we like to call this the symbol of the difference operator. And that tells me everything about the way that this uh, scheme works for any given wave number. So I can do that. And I can look at various things. So for the first derivative at the left, you can see here, these derivatives all look like minus ik, as you would expect. And then there's some term. It's got an i in it. It's got some constant. And then it's got h to a power and k to one more power. And right, so for the cubic basis, I have h to the eighth. I have for the fifth order polynomials, I've got h to the twelfth. Seventh order is h to the sixteenth. Ninth order is h to the 20th. So this is telling me that there's a, uh, a 2p type of superconvergence sitting here on a periodic domain. Same thing on the second derivative sitting here at the right. Again, I have minus k squared across the board. And then I've got h to the 6, h to the 10, h to the 14, h to the 18. So this is, again, a 2, 2p type of superconvergence that's going on here. The other thing you notice is that the spectrum of the operator, which you can look in the picture, the spectrum of the operator is bounded with respect to order. So this is not at all like standard finite elements. With standard finite elements, the spectrum is, the spectral radius of the operator increases to infinity as P goes to infinity. So these have bounded. In fact, the, the, the spectral radius of the operator, just look at the second derivative here, the spectral radius of the operator is almost exactly the same as the Fourier method. In fact, it's converging from the top downward onto the Fourier method. Right, so this is effectively, at the end of the day, you can think about these methods as on a periodic domain, they're like a weak form Fourier method. Right, so as opposed to finite differences at infinite order, they're sort of like a strong form Fourier method. At least that's the way I like to think about it. But I have to deal with boundaries. Right? So I have to deal with boundaries. So what do I do with boundaries? Well, at boundaries, there's a couple of different options that we've come up with. There may be more still that we haven't figured out, of course. But if I want to have generic boundary closures that'll just work for any PDE where I don't have to bother about thinking about it, there's a couple of options. One of them is extrapolation. So what does that mean? I'm a finite difference person. I tend to like to think in terms of ghost points. Um, so you could think that I extrapolate to ghost points and then I eliminate that constraint equation from the equations. The other way you could think is that you, you, you sort of close the system exactly like a finite element does with one-sided interpolation, okay? So near the boundary, whenever the basis functions start to go beyond the, the boundary, I redo the polynomial interpolant that underlies this method, and I sort of use one-sided interpolation instead. So here's an example of the cubic basis functions. 
and the quintic basis function. And you see, I've started to get, I've got these translation invariant things going along. And then all of a sudden, when I get near the boundary, the basis functions get a little bit stranger, uh, which is, is fine. Again, I implement this in my codes using uh, what I call ghost cells. It doesn't have to be that way. And like Jason Hicken, for instance, doesn't implement it that way. And we'll see a little bit about that in a bit. The better boundary condition, the one that looks like the way that we've dealt with these fluid structure problems are what we call compatibility conditions, right? So what are compatibility conditions? Since probably folks aren't uh, familiar with compatibility conditions, I'll, I'll go through it really quickly. You need both the PDE and the boundary condition in order to figure out what the compatibility conditions are for that particular case. So suppose I have scalar wave equation and suppose I have a, Dirich, uh, a Neumann condition sitting here at some point XP, okay? If you time differentiate this boundary condition and then substitute in the time derivative definition from the PDE, you will find that you wind up with uh, these high derivative conditions. The third derivative is zero, fifth derivative is zero, the seventh derivative is zero, and so forth and so on. Those are all gonna amount to even reflection in the basis, right? So the ghost point is gonna be the interior point. And there's a similar process that you can do for the Dirichlet condition that'll all amount to odd reflection. Now, in a more complicated case, you're gonna have to figure out compatibility conditions exactly the same way that we do with these, uh, with these compatibility interface con uh, conditions for FSI. So, but if you do it, you get a huge gain. So what is the gain you get? Well, on the left is if I use this extrapolation closure, and on the right is if I use these compatibility conditions. I should say this is a wave equation in two space dimensions. If I do the extrapolation, I get exactly the theoretical prediction of P plus one. So the standard finite element theory will tell me that I get order P plus one in this case. So here I'm getting order P plus one, which is fine. Um, if I use compatibility condition, on the other hand, I get two P, right? which is quite a lot better. So what's at the top and the bottom? Well, the top and the bottom is short time, time is 1.25, and at the bottom is 100.25. Now the 0.25 is there so that I don't actually, so the exact solution doesn't correspond to an anti-node or a node in the oscillation. But what happens is it, it turns out that if you use extrapolation, but you integrate for a very long time, you observe something that looks a little bit like the superconvergent rate of 2p for a while. And then you go back to order P because that's the slower rate. The reason why is because you've got most of the domains converging, like roughly speaking to P and then right near the boundary for a small number of cells, you're converging at order P plus one. So you, you sort of don't have enough if you have a huge domain or a really long time integration, but eventually you'll always converge at P plus one. Whereas you'll get the two P rate with compatibility always. Plus, the spectral radius of the operator with compatibility is much smaller than with extrapolation. All right, so effectively what's happened is the compatibility conditions give me the, the periodic domain result for the case of a boundary problem. Okay. So now, because I know folks are maybe interested in this, um, I'll just talk briefly about the relationship of GD to, to more standard FEM techniques. And this line of thought is actually something that Sonia helped me figure out or actually figured out and told me about back in in London years ago. So I want to just take a case advection ut plus aux and I'm going to use classical cubic continuous finite elements. So p is three finite elements. On the left I've got the sort of sparsity pattern of the mass and the stiffness matrix sitting here. So I just did a MATLAB spy on that thing. And then on the right I've integrated this thing using a six order uh, runga cutter scheme on a periodic domain to some final time. You see, I've got a nice, uh, there's an exact solution here in black and an approximation in blue. I've got a good approximation to the solution after some time. But if I look at the actual details of the way the error looks, you can pick up on the fact that P is equal to three finite elements has exactly three different kinds of degrees of freedom, right? You can see that in the, there is a green envelope, a red envelope, and a blue envelope, right? And if you are really interested in it, you could probably figure out a set of super convergent points that lie between these points, or you could maybe collocate your degrees of freedom at the super convergent points, and, and maybe that would help you uh, get a super convergent result. On the other hand, if you do this GD thing, 
I'm going to do two different ways of thinking about it. Either I'm going to think of having 12 elements. So I have 12 quote unquote elements with GD. So if I do that, then the mass matrix spies like this. You'll notice that the bandwidth is exactly the same as the bandwidth for the finite element scheme. But the band is completely dense in the GD scheme, right? It's a translation invariant discretization. Whereas in the finite element method, of course, they sort of, some degrees of freedom are coupled to multiple degrees of freedom and some of them are just local to each element, all right? So I, I run this to some final time. Again, this is a 12 elements and 12 elements case. So the finite element's got 36 degrees of freedom. I've got 12. And you see the error here is almost the same magnitude. So I've taken the number of elements and I've divided it by three, the number of degrees of freedom, and I've divided it by three and I get roughly the same error. Okay. The other way you could think about it is that I'm gonna go with 36 degrees of freedom, right? So 36 elements. So here's the spy of the matrix there, same bandwidth. I, I, I've got these periodic images again because it's a, a dense band. And now I'm gonna get an error that's much, much smaller, 10 to minus nine, because now I'm getting this 2P rate all right, I've got 36 degrees of freedom. I'm, I've, I've really gotten quite a gain here. Plus, the spectral radius of the, mat of the matrices involved is substantially better for the GD. And so that's one way you can think about this whole scheme. So you could implement that using projection, which is how I actually did those, those last couple of things. Right? So you can take, you can realize, which is what Sonia uh, helped me out with, you can realize that the GD space is actually a subspace of the standard finite element space. Because it's a subspace, you can figure out a projection operator that will take you one to the other. Will it take you to the, from, the, from the standard finite element scheme to the GD scheme? So effectively what's going on is that the GD scheme is somehow figuring out those bits of the space which are responsible for the accuracy of the scheme and it's not taking account of those bits of the space which are adding artificial stiffness to the problem, okay? So here is an example where this is work from Professor Hicken and his group, where he's done now GD schemes using MFEM um, on an unstructured grid. So the basic idea is you need to define an interpolant on the unstructured grid in order to figure out what the projection operator is from the finite element space to the GD space. So here for p is zero it's pretty clear you just take all your neighbors and the idea that they used was simply to walk yourself out from that central uh, element so for p is one you need to walk yourself out a distance of one and for p is equal to two you have to walk yourself out a distance of two you're then going to form a least in his case he's going to form a least squares interpolant and then he's going to use that least squares interpolant as the as the as the building block for this gd space uh, and then he's going to implement the GD scheme using projection from the standard finite element schemes. In his case, he likes SVP, so he's going to use SVP, and he's done this in MFEM. And so once you've done that, you can actually see, even in an unstructured grid case, you can still observe some of these superconvergences cropping up. So here's a case of the isotropic vortex uh, in, in the Euler equation on an unstructured grid. The GD stuff is in blue and the uh, SVP is in red. And you start to see that you are getting a faster convergence rate from the blue than you are from the red. Uh, and you're, you're going to outperform in terms of a, the error per degree of freedom metric. And so there's probably quite a bit more we could do here, but this was a, a first pass. I was quite happy to see somebody uh, sort through how to use the projections on an unstructured grid. So, so I'm going to summarize I'm nearly at the end. I always like to end a little early. All right, so I've talked about are AMP schemes, these added mass partition schemes for FSI. I've used that as a, a motivation, these non-standard boundary conditions that crop up. I've used that as a motivation to go to these GD schemes as a way to accommodate some of these very strange operators, boundary operators that come up in these AMP type schemes. I've talked briefly about the relationship of GD to classical FEM, including the implementation via projection on an unstructured grid of GD. Uh, in the future, there's a lot of different, of course, FSI regimes that I'm interested in. I'd also like to put FSI on these, these AMP schemes inside a finite element framework and see how they work there. But again, in order to do that, one has to cope with the fact that you have high degree, uh, high derivative boundary conditions. And so maybe GD is a good way to go. I'd like, of course, to do other multi-domain regimes. Um, there's actually 
a lot of different problems which have similar structure to the problems that I've been investigating here for FSI. And then, of course, I'm interested in getting GD. I'm, a, I'm the math person here, in a sense. So I'm interested in collaborators uh, who might be interested in GD as a way to perhaps accelerate standard finite element code. So, for example, uh, one could imagine projecting maybe as a preconditioner for your finite element code, or maybe you want to actually project the whole thing outright. So there's lots of different things one can think about doing with respect to GD. Um, there's also, I didn't talk about it here, but there's uh, discontinuous versions of GD. There's extra continuous versions of GD. We've done interior penalty GD, uh, all sorts of things. So I'll, I'll open it up for questions. I'll, I'll finish there. But if you have any questions, I'm, I'm happy to happy to try to respond. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Jeff. This was uh, this was awesome. Let's give you some virtual applause here. All right. Questions for Jeff. So I let me start with some um, some comments. Um, so this this idea of for GD, this idea of um, interpolating from let's say a patch around an element um, using a you know a polynomial that is defined on the whole patch and then restricting this actually there are a few other places that shows up in finite mm -hmm. elements and I just wanted to mention this to you in case you see connection. Um, one way, one place it shows up is in error estimator. Um, um, mm -hmm. So classical things like ZZ, um, they take a field, they do this interpolation, they restrict locally, and they call this a smoother version of the field, and then mm -hmm. they compare smooth versus original to the, to decide where to refine. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of um, you can think of it as a you know recovering the smoother things, and then. Um, just the other week at um, the Hong Kong conference in San Diego, um, I, I learned about this um, Psych, I think they're called S A I C, no S I A C, SIAC, SIAC filters, smoothness increasing, approximation conserving. I've heard this, but it, this, go ahead. This actually goes on goes 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 back to Bramble and Shafts. 1970s um and it's 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 similar in spirit in the sense that there it's done with a convolution um so the smoothness kind of is defined through a convolution filter that uses b splines but the idea is the same you locally use a smoother version on a patch you use the information from a patch to recover a smoother function locally mm -hmm. um and what they have shown there is they use it as a post processor. So you have your DG solution in particular, this continuous Glorkin. <clears throat> and then you post process it with that filter and you get instead of order P plus one or the two P plus one convergence. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, I wonder if there is some connection. Just I just wanted to mention it. Right. So I, I would I would I've not looked specifically at that, but I've thought a little bit about, you know, like Jennifer Ryan does some of these recovery types of techniques. Yep, 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 example. yep. And there is definitely a tie. The difference is, uh, they're probably really similar, but the difference is that you actually solve directly for it rather than post-process it. Yeah, no, I, I, yeah. Yeah, both of those things that I mentioned are kind of like post-processors. Uh, and and um, yeah, that I, I, I understand, yeah. But, but there's, there's almost certainly a huge amount of tools that are available mm -hmm. to, aid in putting together a, a solver for a particular set of equations. Now, the way that Hicken did it, I'm like, again, I'm super glad that he did it because I think it's great um, and yeah. I wasn't capable of doing it. Um, but it's sort of a proof of principle, right? I don't think you actually want to form the finite element matrices and then project them. Why? Well, because if you're in 3D and you say you go from P is three, well, you're going to take three to the D degrees of freedom out of the system. So you make this enormous system and then you're going to make a smaller one. You want to go straight to the smaller system. Well, to... um, there might be still some benefits in terms of performance if you do this matrix Could straight. Be. Could be. Could if be. you don't but actually I... form matrices, but just Absolutely. pass through and Absolutely. you do uh, action-based 
absolutely absolutely uh, then the structure the local structure of the finite element the tensor product structure in particular for quads and hexes could buy you a lot on say gpus well if you if you've got a tensor product structure you're going to gain even more right because the the, yeah. the finite element the number of degrees of freedom goes up really rapidly if you don't take advantage of that, but you've got much, you know, anyway, you know. <laughs> Speaking of 3D, do you guys have any 3D results yet? Have I done 3D? Or has anybody done 3D? I may have, Tom may have. <laughs> I, I, again, I, I admit to being the theory pusher here, right? And in, in a sense that once I've implemented 2D, I may have actually implemented 3D, <laughs> but it's sort of like I'm done, right? Yeah, yeah. 3D <laughs> is left uh, as an exercise to the reader. Exactly. Right. I shouldn't do that, but of course <laughs> I have. So I, I, I'm I, not totally sure. I, I would be surprised if, if um, Jason doesn't have something. He's also done uh, embedded boundaries. Very cool stuff. Uh, both has... both AMP and GT are really really interesting for us. Oh, and by the way, let me put this out there. Um, Jeff is interested in collaboration, so folks on the AMPM team, anybody else in the community, if you you guys, uh, um, if this sounds interesting, uh, uh, we can we can we can make a connection and get some project going. Yeah, we're we're definitely interested in in collab. It's a great technology, I think, and yeah. I'd like to see people that are more capable of putting it to practice, put it to practice. <laughs> I see a question from Nali. Nali, do you want to unmute and ask it? Oh, sure. I was just wondering if you had any sense of what the sparsity patterns look like in those unstructured grid tests uh, once you got that smaller system. I mean, I know the pictures you showed uh, were for the 1D case were helpful, but then just, you know, what would that look like well, when so they actually make, made the projected Right. So if it was if it was a tensor product grid, then you'd have the same. It'd be a block banded system, and it would fill out exactly the same way. On an unstructured grid, the sparsity pattern is going to be effectively the same as the finite element scheme that you started from, but dense. Right. Right. Because it looked like well, maybe from what the picture was showing, there would be more elements like in yeah on the one on the right oh no for the, with the triangles this the oh this one the triangle mesh this one yeah, yeah for the p equals two so you know we have like kind of more elements there connected that so so your your intuition is probably right every time you missed so every time you've increased the degree of freedom and didn't absolutely have to mm-hmm Every time you've included a degree of freedom and didn't absolutely have to, you probably have done something a little bit bad to the sparsity structure. Is it correct, Jeff, that all degrees of freedom in the dark green triangle are connected, that their rows um, have non zeros for all degrees of freedom in the dark and light? Correct. That would okay. be correct. So the sparsity, the number of non zeros in the row grows. Um, but the width, so again, it's just the same thing here. The number of non zeros on a given row could grow, but the overall band width doesn't because in a, if it was a higher order element based on this plot, you'd be adding little degrees of freedom inside the dark green triangle. Right. So the number of non zero. It's kind of gross, like maybe it will for high order. Exactly. Is the order, but exactly. they're kind, of, but they're more spread out. That's right. That's exactly right. And in this particular way of doing it, the way that again Professor Hicken has done it here, if again I'm doing this sort of graph-based distance, if I have included another light green triangle that doesn't have to be included from the polynomial interpolation perspective then the actual bandwidth probably grows in that process as well. Yeah. Right, because in the standard finite element, you would only be adding those degrees of freedom that you absolutely needed in the, in the triangle. Does, it, does that answer your question, Natalie? Yes, thank you. 
Okay, other questions? I have a question. <clears throat> um, has there been any work on seeing how these types of shape functions interact with discontinuities? So shocks or cracks, strong discontinuity. Right, so a little bit, um, maybe two things to say there, there's linear discontinuities and then there's shocks, right? So for linear discontinuities, uh, there's really not, nothing, nothing to say, really. It, everything behaves basically as you'd expect. Now, Brett Buckner and I, uh, along with Tom, did do a discontinuous version of this so that you can actually do an upwind type of scheme. That gives you basically the, the DG version of this scheme, with the exception that with the with this GD stuff, the upwind dissipation happens everywhere. So every degree of freedom has equal amounts of upwind dissipation. Whereas in a standard finite uh, GD type of DG type of uh, upwind scheme, you only get dissipation on the skeleton of the mesh. So there's a bit of a difference there. Um, but I, there's not been too many, too much study in the nonlinear shocks. Like we could do it. I'm happy to try it. Um, I think it would work better than DG for exactly the reason I said, because the dissipation occurs globally. It's volumetric dissipation as opposed to just on the skeleton. But I haven't looked at it in, in any detail yet. Does that help answer? Sure, it was just an exploratory question. Thank you for entertaining it. Thanks, Stefan. Okay, other questions? Have you guys thought about um, adaptivity? Uh, maybe both P adaptivity and H adaptivity, MR? But thought, thought a lot about it. Um not done anything with it. So in some sense, you might think that P adaptivity would be really natural. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's probably true. I'm a little bit afraid of it, um, partly because the difficulty in actually forming the matrices, the expense actually comes in through the assembly. Now, why, why is the assembly coming in as the expensive part? The assembly comes in as expensive because you've got this piecewise continuous basis function. So I can't just integrate phi j against phi k with a single quadrature. I have to integrate it piecewise quadrature. Mm -hmm. right, so that's expensive. Uh, so there is an expense to be paid there and doing adaptivity is gonna mean I can't pre-compute those, or at least if I did pre-compute I have to sort of pre-compute all different <laughs> options for orders against each other. But again, if you do matrix free with projection, that expense may be not that visible. You're, you're absolutely right. And I'm, I mean, like I said, I'm just a little bit afraid of it. I think there's a yeah. lot to be done there. The other thing to say, though, is one of the reasons why I think it might be good is because there is no, the data structure is exactly the same for any order. Right, so I don't have to add a degree of freedom in order to adapt P. Assuming uniform grid. Even assuming non-uniform grid, I just keep going to neighbors. Yep, so that, that, that is definite advantage, yes. Right, so there would be, so in principle, in my mind at least, there would be no need to add, a, maybe there's a use case why you would want to, but in my mind at least, I want to say that you don't, the data structure is independent of P, which could be an advantage, maybe. Very cool. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure, but <laughs> I've thought about it to answer your questions on you, but I have not. Yeah. Oh, this is, this is cool not done. The other thing we have done is um, we've thought about doing order based multi grid. Again, because I have a whole hierarchy of so a given set of data structure, a given data structure defines any order I like. Yep. And, and because I have that, I can do multi grid in order. And there's some reason to think that works reasonably well. Um, but I haven't, I've, I've done some really primitive testing on that, but I've not gone too far, but it's, it's a fun thing to think about. 
well, since you opened that can, um, there's another approach that we use for preconditioning, which is what we call lower the refined, uh, which people call FEMSEM, uh, where you just, um, instead of doing P multigrid, um, you directly go from the high order problem to a, a lower the problem, but on the refined grid. So I guess in your case, it will be a lower the discretization on the original grid. Um, and in the higher the case, the two, the stiffness matrix, the mass matrix, are spectrally equivalent independent of P. Is, no, no, no. That's not the case here. Well, they're not exactly, so yeah, they're not exactly independent. They're pretty, they're pretty close to independent. I see what you're saying. And there, what you can do is, you know, you do matrix free higher the application. You just transfer the residual just as a vector to the lower the problem. The lower the problem is assembled. You have multi grid on it with coarsening of in H. Um, and then you go back, and that's optimal because of the independent of P. One thing that comes to mind that you could do here is you could potentially use these schemes as a preconditioner for your. That's also a possibility. Yep. For your, for your multi grid, right? Because you could easily project onto these spaces, I think. But that's actually interesting because uh, Bill and his student, um, Kamala, mm -hmm. they just finished a paper that does, they do multigrid using low order discretizations for the smoother. So, so if you have a pth order discretization, they immediately go down to second order and then they smooth on that. And that works pretty well too. So it sounds similar to what you're doing. Yeah, interesting. So many games to play. <laughs> Last one. Have you thought about any, um, you know, spaces that are not H1 spaces uh, or DG? So you've done H1, you've done, you've done L2, but what about if I want to use something like this for H curl or H diff for electromagnetics? So, um, yeah. So um, the way that interpolants work, you're free to build in extra constraints into the actual polynomial interpolant. The one mm -hmm. thing we have done, we call them D splines, mm -hmm. uh, which, right? So, so Hugh's stuff is built all around all this uh, isogeometric stuff is built around splines. Yeah. But a D spline says, look, I'd like to increase the continuity, but I'd like to do it with local information. So at a node, we take and we find a difference approximation to the derivative at that node. And then we impose that the derivative of the interpolant matches there. So you can build in any degree of continuity you like using local information doing that. So that's one thing we have done. We did that for high order operators. Um, I do think it's possible to build in other types of constraints. For example, you, you mentioned the Maxwell equip, the, the electromagnetics case. I think you could build in additional constraints. For example, you could build in the divergence constraint into the interpolant itself. I've not done that, but I think it's possible. Okay, thanks. Okay, um, any other questions? Last chance. Last chance. <laughs> so your basis is uh, quite close to those uh, kernels they got from those SAIC filtering. Um, do you know if there's any natural connections between them? I mean, you assume there must be, right? <laughs> I don't, I don't, There's a paper I don't, there. I don't. It's awfully close. That. I can tell you that. Um, I'm, I've been working a little bit on that uh, recently. Uh, I mean, you, you'd almost assume there has to be, right? Because there's, there's all these things are all intertwined. Um, yeah. Exactly, turning up how it's related. Uh, right. you know. It's also interesting these basis functions, just from a mathematical perspective. If I want to write down the basis for the Fourier transform. Right, it's sync. Right, if you look at the limit of these basis functions, and assumingly, uh, presumably these SAIC basis functions as well, the limit is sync at infinite order. Right, they approach sync. Right? So you do, in fact, have this notion that things are tied to the Fourier transform, as you might. You almost have to guess that sitting underneath everything. All right, Chi, are you are you aware of using those not as filters, but? discretization because that's one big difference here 
No, I, I, well, that's not what we are doing at Nelson Team. We are uh, we are trying to use that for some post processing for uh, pick yes. simulation. And that's that's how they that's that's the only way that I know of that they are being used. That's right. Uh, but I agree that they are very close. That's why I brought them up. I think there is a there is a paper there to be written by someone. Uh, I mean, there's also there's also a class of schemes called PNPM, which yeah. is there's a guy actually at Livermore, uh, Robert Norgali does these. He's he's done them with um, Dumpster, Michael Dumpster, and, and yeah. collaborators. They're like they're similar in the sense that you you take a local construction based on neighbor data. Now, the difference there is that they don't build an actual weak form operator, so the energy estimate's gone. Potentially, although the schemes seem to work really well. So, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but again, there's a very, there's a similarity there in that you're sort of doing these things where you're looking to neighbor data uh, rather than trying to introduce an interior degrees of freedom. So there's all sorts of cons there's consistency and things are it's all the same somehow. Right? It's just reinventing the wheel.